Is it not working? It never works. Does it work? Yes. yes. Good evening and welcome to the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom uh, for what I think will be a very exciting uh, evening and, uh, and discussion. Um, we all remember, of course, the stories already since, uh, well, since, since, since the Brexit vote and the first election of Trump. It's all about stories about involvement of, uh, of Russia in, in, uh, in all kinds of elections and uh, in politics uh, of countries uh, outside uh, Russia. Um, and I don't think uh, anybody would have expected that we would at some point even then see the sort of thing we're now seeing uh, on Cyprus. So I'm, I'm really interested in, in hearing more details about that and about the further uh, situation uh, as regards uh, Russian influence on our media, our politics, and so on. Of course, it's a big issue in the European Parliament at the moment, as it is in several national parliaments, uh, in what kind of involvement uh, members of parliament have uh, and, and, and others. Um, so let's see what, what this all brings. But I especially want to give a big compliment to our office in Athens uh, for having pursued this, uh, this issue uh, and bringing it to the fore and also contacting us uh, to see whether we could do anything with it uh, in Brussels, which we are more than delighted to do. So I love all credit to you, uh, and also the microphone to you. <laughs> so I wish you a very good evening, and well, thank you for being here. Uh, all right, so ladies and gentlemen, well, welcome to our joint event of FNF Europe and FNF Greece in Cyprus. Um, I'm here with my colleague Eleni from the sunny Athens. Um, and yes, our event is focused on the Cyprus Connection, uncovering Russia's media strategy in the EU. Today we gathered here, as I understand it, to address a topic of the utmost importance, uh, one that resonates deeply with the fabric of European democracy and security. Uh, also, just a breath away from the European elections and an era where information flows really rapidly, the fight against disinformation stands as a cornerstone of safeguarding democratic principles. The spread of falsehood not only undermines trust at this point, not only in Greece, not only in Cyprus, but also in all states of European Union, uh, trust in institutions, but also polarizes very much the public opinion and threatens uh, the very foundation of our democratic process. Um, Cyprus, as we have seen uh, from uh, the work that, it, that we did with the Institute for Mass Media in Cyprus and uh, Mr. Nicolas Karelis, uh, serves as a prime example of a European nation that is heavily influenced at this point by Moscow, where Russian officials and businessmen wield considerable economic and political sway. Yet this influence extends far beyond the economic ties in the country, uh, for example, also to media narratives. So as we confront uh, the realities of Russians' hybrid warfare uh, tactics, uh, especially since uh, the start of the war in Ukraine, um, it's important to discuss this issue, not only from an academic point of view, but from a reality point of view. So today we have the privilege of hearing for, from some esteemed experts uh, who will shed light on various aspects of this complex issue. Unfortunately, as you can see from our panel, um, uh, Ms. Ali Stolmeyer, the founder and executive director of the nonpartisan NGO Defend Democracy, is not with us. Uh, due to, to an unforeseen health issue, we will show well. However, we have uh, Mr. Chris Powells to my right, uh, the audience manager of Directive. Uh, he has been working at Directive since 2020, first as its head of communications and now at the management of the newsroom. And uh, he will share with us uh, some of his own experiences from Directive. Uh, to the right of Mr. Powells, we have Christopher Miguel Frenderson, the policy and press advisor at the European Parliament for Renew Europe. Uh, Vice President Morten Lokegaard, if I, I didn't, perfect. okay, <laughs> all right. And uh, of course, uh, our beloved partner uh, for the Athens office, Mr. Nicolas Karidis, who is the director of the Nonprofit Institute for Mass Media at the Universitas Foundation in Nicosia. In Cyprus, he has been born in London, went to school in Cyprus, studied in the US and the UK. And uh, after a spell as a journalist in London, he worked for the European Commission until 2004, 
and following Cyprus' accession to the EU, he set up uh, Ambassade Public Affairs and was later among the founders and contributing edit editors of the news outlet Offsite. So, he is also the author of Knowing One's Place, a collection of essays uh, on journalism, history and football, interestingly enough. Uh, he is the member of the team drafting the annual media pluralism report on Cyprus for the European University Institute in Florence. And uh, he is the one uh, with whom we are going to study, uh, start this discussion. Um, we look forward to hear what you have found from the research you did. It's a red button. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for coming. Um, thank you, Alona, for uh, making this happen. Um, this this is the study that was um, completed at the end of last year. Um, the idea belonged to the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. Uh, we embraced it not only because it was interesting in itself, but because um, it kind of set with the in Institute's own um, activism in promoting uh, and studying issues that related to journalism, editorial independence, uh, media pluralism, the whole context of how journalism uh, is produced. Uh, though there is considerable trafficking of Russia-friendly uh, content in Cyprus, this information as such was not a key element of this study because at the time, and this is February 2022, uh, this information was not really a pressing need for Russia given that Cyprus was essentially in the back. Uh, the Cypriot political elite, the socio-economic establishment, uh, and the public were already very Russified. This, of course, had been in part uh, a result of various degrees of disinformation and active measures which had taken place over many decades. Um, now, okay. Now, the country's stance on Russia is complicated and woven into many aspects of the country's psyche. The scars of um, the collapse of the economy 10 years ago, the emergence of a new affluent class uh, linked to property development, the, the very embarrassing uh, passport scheme, the golden passport scheme, uh, the existence of a very strong communist party on the island, the influence of the church, and the political problem of Cyprus itself, which requires Cyprus to seek uh, Russian Russian allegiance in the UN Security Council when it feels that the US and the UK don't stand with it on issues that matter to the national issue. Now, but our concern was essentially the, the state of the media. And that, in Cyprus, is in very bad shape. Uh, I'll come to that in a moment, but I should say that as Cyprus's perception of Russia shifts, and as Cyprus aligns itself more comfortably with the EU, and tightens its oversight mechanisms, the disinformation front will become more intense. It hadn't been in the past, but now it will begin to become more intense. Um, Russia will not be happy with um, how things turned out in Cyprus in the last couple of years. And uh, I, I think that the, C the Cypriot information ecosystem, and I would argue the Cypriot state itself, are not ready to deal with what, what might come. Uh, my sources are already observing a much more strategic and aggressive Russian approach in Cyprus at this moment. Now, some, uh, some snapshots to, um, to give you some context. Uh, just to highlight a little bit of uh, the risks that exist in Cyprus, in the information uh, ecosystem in Cyprus. I don't want to give the impression that um, Cyprus is, is a place of journalistic hell. That, it, that is not this is not right, and uh, it would be wrong to if I left you with that impression. Um, it, it's not Hungary, it's not Turkey, but it has some problems. Uh, freedom of expression, uh, fundamental protection, safety of journalists uh, are constitutionally safeguarded in Cyprus, and they work well in practice. But it doesn't have a culture of investigative journalism. Uh, media pluralism is, is very poor. 
Uh, you can see here, this is uh, from the Center for Media Pluralism and Media Freedom Annual Report, which is issued for all the member states of the EU. This is the, the graph for the risk factor in red with regard to uh, media plurality. Yeah, as you can see, Cyprus and many other countries have a, 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 a big issue. Now, political parties in Cyprus uh, drive the uh, agenda and media follow. The media are not sustainable. There is no transparency of ownership. Uh, you can see here how Cyprus fail, fares with regard to, to the risk factor of ownership. Um, the media are heavily reliant on, on dwindling advertisers. Public interest is only served when it coincides with the political or commercial interest of the media itself. There is no separation between commercial departments and editorial departments. In, in many cases, in fact, media are so small that uh, the editorial and the commercial departments may be sharing the same desk. Crucially, Cypriot journalists are not paid very well. There is inevitably a lot of other work that they do, and a lot of that work is in conflict with, with what they should be doing as journalists. And to that extent, there is also, because of that, there is uh, self-censorship. Now, the media scene is, is shaky and, and vulnerable. Now, um, regarding the, the coverage that we, we uh, oversaw in, in, the, uh, in the study, in a nutshell, I would say that initially the media's response to the invasion uh, in February 22 was hesitant and, and rather lukewarm, but it gradually became more pragmatic as the war intensified. It was not that different to the uh, response of the Cypriot government and the Cypriot political establishment, which managed very quickly to adjust to, to the situation, knowing that it would cost Cyprus a great deal if it were to deviate from the EU, both in terms of its image in the EU, in terms of its national problem. Um, but its, instinct were, its instincts were to, to um, align with uh, Russian interests. Now, the, the socio-economic uh, establishment and the public at large uh, took longer to, to adapt to this reality. This is from the Eurobarometer of uh, May 2022. You can see how Cyprus fared in, uh, it was bottom of the league in terms of uh, this particular question whether the public felt that uh, Russian authorities were responsible first and foremost for what was happening in Ukraine. Cyprus was the only country where the majority believed that uh, Russia was not responsible for what was happening. This was May 2022. Now, um, it, this hasn't changed much. Um, it, it could be because we're not thinking about it much. I mean, if you think about Gaza coming after Ukraine, both wars still going, and it's not inevitable to consider that we're not thinking about what's happening in the Ukraine that much. In Ukraine, sorry, not that much. Now, the, the key, the key, uh, the key attitude driver uh, in Cyprus at this time was what about us? What about us, the Cypriots? So, yes, Ukraine, but what about us? We had suffered the Turkish invasion. Why? Why is it different to how we were treated? And also, what about the U.S.? What about the EU? What about uh, NATO? What about the Balkans? What about Iraq? All of this drove the conversation and the media responded to that sentiment. Now, when, when Zelensky addressed the, um, uh, the House of Representatives in April 2022, the media attention was overwhelmingly refracted through the notion, why did he not talk about Turkey and our injustice? And it is true that he mentioned nothing about Turkey when he addressed the Cypriot Parliament. That could very well have been a, a mistake by his speechwriter, you, you never know. But the fact is that he didn't. But the fact that he didn't made Russia more attractive for Cypriots. Or, or at least in their idea, they felt that you know there's some sort of collusion between Ukraine and Turkey, and we're being ignored. Um, and there's this distorted perception that Russia, for some reason, is a friend of Cyprus, which is, in real terms, it is not. Now, generally, the media uh, shifted into an automatic and convenient self-indulgence. I think this is deliberate because they do not want to deal with the substance, and perhaps more depressingly, they do not want to deal or cannot deal with the substance itself. It always has to be about Cyprus because that's all the media know, and 
unfortunately and especially because it's all the politicians know. They are not capable of going beyond silence. And this is, this is a crucial element of how the media responds. Um, significantly, such environments of ignorance is where this information works wonders. Now, the other big destruction um, in Cyprus uh, and the convenient way of not addressing Russia head on was the incessant conversation about the cost to the Cypriot economy from the war in Ukraine. Uh, what it meant for its uh, services sector, what it meant for the tourism and all that. There was some good journalism. Uh, there's no question about it. There was good reporting. One newspaper managed to send correspondence to Kiev and twice, uh, which is a rarity for Cyprus. But um, our study looked very closely also to this newspaper, uh, which is the Communist Party's mouthpiece. And this is the 24th of February 22, you can see on the left, and this is the 28th. Both front page issues deal with something which is very local, and this is the, like the, the first days of the war. It, it's like as if the war is happening by the way. And at the top of the skyline of the front page, you can see at the top, it says somewhere that uh, China is saying that the US is responsible for what's happening or what's about to happen in Ukraine. And on the right here, you can see this on the 28th of February, there is a reference to negotiations taking place that was going to be in Constantinople in, uh, in, uh, between Ukraine and Russia, which never came through. And then on the right, there is a kind of a deviating tactic, a very, very f uh, popular one. You, you pay attention to what the EU is doing, arming Ukraine, and also banning the media in, uh, in Europe. So this, the war is happening, but we're focusing on those, on those issues. Uh, I, will, I will end in a, in a minute, I'm sorry. I, I'm sure, I'm conscious I took too long. Um, so I won't tire you with, with more details, uh, but I want to make a general point, um, and that is that as an institute, our own crusade is based on the notion that besides raising awareness about disinformation, about Russia's machinations, uh, besides media literacy, besides uh, the welcome elements of the European Media Freedom Act, which will be extremely useful for Cyprus, the one thing that can help fight disinformation is better journalism. Naive as it may sound, better journalism is one of the antidotes to uh, disinformation. I stress this because, as you can see, I come from a country in which journalism is in a crisis. Uh, and it has become susceptible to, to, to many things that will uh, put democracy at risk, perhaps in, in, in the next few years. Um, I also say this because journalism is partly responsible for this information. Uh, it is the years of superficiality, the sensationalism, the erosion of editorial independence, the way journalistic organizations allowed commercial considerations to trump uh, their sense of purpose and to dilute their product. All this has led to an erosion of trust, and it is this erosion of trust that has uh, allowed bad actors to exploit um, the scene through social media. And let's not forget also that the media have capitulated to the social media mindset themselves. So I'll, I'll finish there and, and we can pick it up later. Thank you. Thank you very much. some time for questions that uh, maybe uh, the audience has about the study or other things. Uh, I do have some questions, so I don't know that for sure. Um, let us stay on, on the media landscape and uh, maybe see what is the wider uh, image. So I will uh, give the floor to Mr. Powells. Uh, he has been coordinating the uh, Iraqis' <coughs> response to the start of uh, the Russians' full-scale invasion to Ukraine. So what is your experience with that, and how can we solve the problem? Yeah. So there's, there's a lot that uh, we could talk about this evening, but I will try and keep it as short as possible so there's more time for questions. But what I will say is, yes, when, uh, when we had uh, February 24th in 2022, um, it became a full-time job for myself and my team to uh, basically deal with social media activity <laughs> coming, from, coming from Russia, uh, essentially trolling uh, and a lot of these false claims that we were seeing at the beginning of the war. And not all media take their, their platform presence responsibly in vetting these things, but for us it really became a day job. I, I give talks about this on its own, uh, how it was a troll crossover event 
the different types of trolls you have that get involved um, and how we could end up just seeing that it's all essentially coming from one place and that one place is Russia. Um, but when it comes to facing that head on, I would say two things. First, the, the EU has essentially banned, uh, turned off the tap. So Russian media itself can't directly speak to Europeans as easily anymore as it used to be able to. This is good, this, this helps a great deal. It means you can't really reference Russia today uh, in the same way as you used to be able to. It is harder to do that as another media outlet and be taken seriously. Um, we also have done more about trolls. Like I don't just mean media outlets have, but uh, governments have too. It's about tracking them down, how you block them from even coming in the first place. These are these. There's still work to do, but it's uh, it's it's begun the work. Um, what I think is more important and uh, scarier is that a, a lot of the opportunity for uh, Russian influence in media and in Europe in general, it is stuff that we can prevent. And uh, rather than treat the symptoms like uh, troll attacks, better to prevent the illness in the first place. So what I thought I would share with you is what we've seen at Directive is four traps. Uh, that media can fall into very easily. Not only media, by the way, politicians as well, and, and civil society organizations and more, but definitely media. And if we did a better job at avoiding those traps, I think most of the struggle would be, would be over in terms of uh, Russian influence in the EU. So the first trap is about frames themselves. So when you are putting together an article, the context in which it happens. I'll, I'll give an example to try and make it make sense. There are lots of them. And we've seen many since the, uh, the full-scale invasion, sadly. The first one, which I think you will all remember, is about this idea that Ukraine is somehow divided between West and East, between a Ukrainian-speaking West and a Russian-speaking East. That's a, a useful <coughs> prism for the claims that the Kremlin had about defending Russian speakers. It makes it uh, easy for a non-Ukraine specialist mind to understand, oh, there's this division there, okay, this is, it's a really complicated issue, blah, blah. But the fact of the matter is that Russia is killing Russian speakers more than it's killing Ukrainian speakers. Um, the Russian speakers in Kharkiv didn't get a choice on this matter. Uh, they don't want to be part of Russia and they are, they are pushing back. So it's just a frame that's used to support an argument. Um, another one is about the Putin explanation of uh, why, why all this anger at the West, you know, this idea of NATO expansionism. He'll refer to some small agreement in. Uh, the 90s about how NATO wouldn't expand east, but this is not, it's not got a legal basis, it's nothing in writing, it's like my mate Dave said this, therefore 15 years later, you know, where the world totally hasn't changed in any way, this is still valid. No, of course not, but in, in writing this in the first place, you're already inheriting the frame a bit of how Russia thinks. If you start with that, then you're already a bit trapped in how you argue, you have to argue yourself out of a Russian position instead of um, arguing your own, or in the case of the media, just going straight for the truth. You're, you're trapped already in a rhetorical device. So that's maybe the first and most important frame, which every politician also should be aware of. Don't be trapped in the argument of your opponent. Make your own arguments. <laughs> so the first one. <laughs> Second one is that, and this is a very media-specific one, the trap of balance. So um, a good journalist is required to seek different perspectives around an issue. It shows that you're taking your, your topic seriously, that you're not going to be too partisan in one direction. But you're active if we're reporting on a, I don't know, a new policy a proposal coming out of the commission. We, of course, want to know the business perspective as well, because it's usually them that get affected by it. But we might also want to know the, the people who it's designed to protect. We might want to know the position from the commission. We might want to know how different MEPs view it to get a mix of views so the reader can make their own mind up. This is responsible journalism, and that's what we should mean by balance. However, there's a tendency that balance means you give equal sides to two sides of an argument without really saying what the truth is. Uh, I come from the UK, this is the big criticism of the BBC that we had all the way through the years of uh, Brexit and then negotiating out of the EU, always these two sides, one is clearly just lying, one might be wrong but it's not willfully misleading people. This is something that Russia relies on all the time, let us have our perspective, let us have our right to reply. But either don't give it to them in the first place, just recognising that it's not worth the column inches in your newspaper or if you feel like you have to in order to show that you've done your due diligence, you have to be careful when you publish something you know to be a lie. 
It's about putting it in a sandwich, truth sandwich. You put your false claim, you have to put your context in at the beginning, and you also have to tackle immediately after, not, not further down, not in a different paragraph, but immediately why this thing is wrong. Um, otherwise, it's, a, it's left unchecked, and that's the problem. You'll see this a lot on social media as well with newspapers. They'll often quote a headline from someone who's misleading because it's got shock value. People will want to click it. In the article, it might say why it's wrong, but too late. How many articles have you seen on social media that you haven't clicked, but you've read the headline? We all do it. Everyone does it. So again, being responsible. Whatever the lie appears, it should appear as rarely as possible. But when it does, the truth has to appear with it immediately, no matter where it is. That's the second trap. I've got two more. <laughs> so, the trap of originality is the third one. Um, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine was uh, over two years ago now. So this is going to sound horrible, but as, an, as a media, you have to keep it interesting. I mean, some, some of us maybe just find it interesting in its own right, but I, I tell you, for the, the general audience, it's, it's, it's not the case. What that means is you might try and find angles that just don't help the issue. So um, I'll give one example. It's maybe not the best one, but it, but it does help. Um, when, when the Force Invasion began, the New York Times was very quick uh, to try and find angles that nobody else would have. And so what did they hit on? Well, they hit on the story of millions of Ukrainian refugees leaving the country, but let's focus on this question that maybe there's some racial discrimination going on to a small number of them. And a lot of people in our community here in Brussels, they shared it, because it's a, generally a progressive city, we like to care about minorities, fits perfectly with the type of people that uh, are wanting to be influenced. Scratch the surface, wasn't Ukrainians, it was Polish border guards. <laughs> and it was one case. Uh, now, it doesn't mean it's right, but if you put it in the perspective of the whole story where you've literally got six million people leaving the country in a month, I mean, sorry, it's not the, it's not the main story. But that's what happens when you're desperate to find a different angle in something new. There, there are better ways to be original, which takes me to my fourth trap, the trap of news avoidance. Because if you're not being original, people get bored, or people don't want to hear about it. They, they can't handle this much negativity. They want to go back to their garden or cook or go on Etsy or something. But um, the fact is you need them to read this. The public services, they've got, to, they've got to come back. So how do you do it? You could do this thing of desperately trying to be original and find a way through, but I'd say it's irresponsible. What might be more helpful is think about what the reader's needs could be. So. This is coming up more and more as a topic as we talk about Gen Z in the media. This is an existential crisis. One is the business model, which you talked about very well. The other is how do we appeal to young readers, young news consumers, who are primarily using social media, and the, the thing we tend to say is they don't read the news anymore. Some of them do. Um, but how to reach them? Well, a lot of research has gone into this. They care more than any other demographic about solutions-based journalism. So, media that care about this are starting to think about solutions-based journalism, constructive journalism, how to basically introduce to your content already what the next steps might be, what the implications might be, what the possible ways out could be. And there's always a way to give it that kind of angle in your, in your news writing to give people something at least to reach for. Um, the downside of that is you can't claim as easily anymore to be like this neutral, objective source of truth, because you sometimes have to take a side. Um, and that's something, at least um, in countries like in Western Europe, we've been trying to show that we're not. We're trying to show that we're really neutral referees. This has got to change. We've got to be biased towards the truth. That's what the Washington Post always says, biased towards the truth. Uh, when you think about that, you will sometimes go against some politicians, sometimes against others, but at the end of the day, you're serving your audience. And that's the main thing you should be doing as a media. I do that. Great, thank you so much. <laughs> so let me ask Mr. Fredersen, uh, what about the European Parliament? How much do politicians care there about this information? Because I mean, we have a legal framework for all of these things, but what is going on in reality? That's a, uh, I'm just, yeah, I think I'm around here. That's a very good question, uh, and of course, the European uh, or the members of the European Parliament cares a whole lot about this information. Uh, we had a temporary committee in the Parliament that started around 2020, so already ahead of the Russian invasion. Uh, some members of the European Parliament 
were, you could say, ahead of their time. They saw the issue. It wasn't my boss at the time, uh, but he got on later. Uh, but it was, um, we, had, we started the temporary committee and we finished, I believe, uh, time is, uh, yeah, after five years in Parliament, <coughs> it, 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 it flowed together a lot of it. But we, we worked together, uh, we worked on the disinformation or foreign interference in democratic processes for around two years. And we came up with a bunch of recommendations, which you can read online. I won't, don't worry, I won't go through all of it. It, it is a lot. Um, but they care, we care a lot about uh, disinformation in the, in the parliament for a number of reasons. Well, one is, of course, the defense of democracy. We have serious risks if we don't manage to counter disinformation. Another, uh, another issue is, of course, freedom of speech because we want to fight this information, but at the same time, my MEP that I'm working for, Danish Modern Logikart, he's from a liberal party. So of course, uh, freedom of speech is very important to him. So how do we protect this at the same time? That is an issue that is, that is not solved yet, and we don't know how, uh, to what extent the legislation and the codes that are currently in place, if they will, if they will limit freedom of speech, or to what extent? Is it an acceptable extent, or is it uh, is it uh, is it too much? We don't know yet. We will see. We will have to see uh, with the implementation of the DSA. But it is one big issue. And why is it an issue? Because does it really matter that uh, some uh, don't get to s express their opinion or express uh, maybe a misinformed opinion? Uh, yeah, that is an issue. And we, me and my boss believes, both of us believes it's an issue because if people see that the, that the EU is censoring and controlling what narratives are out there, some people will become more skeptical. Uh, the European Union will lose legitimacy in their eyes and that's, uh, well, that's a danger to the whole project. Uh, project. Um, it, might, it might be a minority of people who think like this and feel like this, but it is still an issue we need to be focused about. So I will touch upon some of the solutions that we, we've uh, worked on or suggested in the Parliament. One of them, uh, which is uh, very much necessary, is to strengthen the fact-checking community in the EU. Right now, they don't have res the resources they need at all. Not at all. And that is necessary, because we don't want, when we, if we want to f protect freedom of speech, we can't have the platforms just uh, by themselves selecting what is disinformation and what is not. And we can't uh, let it be up to users only to flag disinformation content, because they also have their own opinion. So we need independent fact checkers. And we need to um, improve their current working conditions uh, in the EU, and also support uh, with money. Um, one of the things that was an issue during uh, the Parliament work on disinformation is uh, the code of conduct on uh, disinformation, on the code of uh, practice on disinformation. The issue is, uh, it has a lot of, um, it means well, the code, it means very well, but is it sufficient? No, not at all. Uh, one thing is, of course, is because it's not binding. We have pushed in the parliament several times for, uh, or consistently, for um, the commission to try to adopt some of these, um, some of these um, tasks or some of these, uh, yeah, tasks that the that the platforms have to do under the code and try to include it in the DSA or maybe try to include it in an update on the DSA later. But the commission is very reluctant to making some of these things binding. Is that an issue? Yes, it is. I was trying to research it a bit before coming here. Uh, let me see if I can quickly find it. Some of the issues with the code of uh, code of code of conduct of then, uh, on disinformation is uh, that there's the reporting from the platform. They reported twice already: uh, January last year and in July last year. Uh, and what you can see already is that they haven't really standardized their reporting, so it's hard to compare the, the information they or the data they hand in uh, due to the code. So it's not really comparable. That's of course an issue. Making it legally binding and setting a common set of rules would make it better, of course. Um, 
another thing is that the data they provide or the information they provide, some of it is is not really uh, rep. Uh, how do you say it? It's not really possible to replicate. What I want to say. Um, and that's of course an issue. Then you, they can claim whatever, and we can't really check if it's true or not. That's also an issue. Um, yeah, some of this will be addressed through the DSA, I believe, in Article Forty. Uh, the, the the platforms have to make sure that uh, vetted researchers have better access to understanding uh, real life effects of online activity. Uh, that's of course important. One of those things that is important is knowing more about algorithms and how they work. When we were doing the last round of recommendation in Parliament, I was speaking to the fact-checking community and asking how how well is it going. The code was in was in uh, was in effect, but the DSA of course wasn't yet. And the the message from from the fact checkers was pretty clear. They was they were not giving access to the algorithms by the platforms. One, uh, one backside again of not having a, a binding, binding uh, set of rules here. So, so uh, it's clear that the code is not working. It's clear that we don't have the fact-checking community currently in the EU. And it's also clear that the freedom of speech might be an issue. So, a lot of issues. What do we need more? Uh, well, we need possibly more legislation, and uh, my MEP, who is liberal as I mentioned, is not a big fan of just legislation for legislation's sake. Uh, but it's clear that the issue here demands more legislation. One thing is, could it be necessary to have legislation, common legislation, that criminalizes uh, the systematic spread of disinformation? So of course there's a big difference between uh, a person uh, in good faith, passing on some information he or she believes is right, and then a person who systematically uh, passes on information that they know to be wrong, and then that they might have uh, received from uh, Russian agents or anything else. There is a difference, and we need to look into this and see if it's possible to criminalize this. Another thing, as I mentioned, we need to strengthen the fact checking community. And apart from this, um, we should also consider, this has been a, a, a proposal from the parliament for a long time, as I mentioned, to make some of the um, obligations of the uh, unbinding obligations in the code, make them binding. We have to standardize and make it easy for both the population and also researchers and others to be able to check uh, and compare social media platforms and see if they are delivering on their promises and also EU legislation. Yes. Great, thank you very much. All right, I, uh, uh, we have already covered a, a lot of uh, fact checking. I have here legislation, the question if we need more, if it's gonna solve the problems, uh, new problems arising, also not falling into traps. Thank you very much for, the, uh, for that tricks. Um, I suggest opening up to, to the audience and uh, for now I keep my own questions for myself and then if we have the time we discuss this. All right, um, do we have a microphone for the, for the audience as well? No? We could, yeah. Just pass around. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, does anybody have it? All right, the gentleman over there. Let's start. Okay. Hey, uh, yeah. Uh, if you're so kind, no. maybe, maybe state uh, well, who you enough. are as well. And uh, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for being here, first of all. My name is Jonas Schmidl. I'm from the German Chamber of Economics and Trade. Uh, thanks for this overview. It's very interesting to get. Oh, to get different points about the agenda of Russia because they are very active in different fields, not only Cyprus, uh, which leads me to my question because we are now in a situation that German politicians from the right-wing party got paved. It's not officially, um, but yeah, it seems like. And I want to ask if this is like, uh, 
something that is ongoing in other countries as well, and if there are leads to media as well, which are paid from Russia, because this would be like the undergoing of the democratic systems in Europe overall, I guess. Um, yeah, open to all of you. This is a tough one. Who wants to take it? I'll address, it. This I'll address okay. it to the extent that I know. Um, there was a, an OCCRP investigation, the Organized uh, Crime and Corruption Reporting Network, that found that um, money coming from uh, the circle near uh, President Putin had uh, channeled money into Cyprus for the establishment of a political party a Russian political party uh, that managed to actually gain or donate money to various groups in Cyprus. One of the recipients was the Communist Party of Cyprus, which got a small amount of money, but nonetheless it got some money. Um, they were pushing certain uh, policy ideas which would be favorable to Russian investors. Uh, for example, um, when the government, during the uh, collapse of the economy, was trying to shore up trusts or tighten its oversight mechanisms, there were attempts to um, affect certain provisions of the legislations that would be detrimental to Russian interests. So there was some uh, actual effect in the way that they did this. Uh, there are other ways that they are moving in terms of um, identifying marginal groups which have specific identity issues at heart. And I, wouldn't, I don't know whether they fund them, but I know that they encourage them in terms of amplifying polarization in the country. So when it comes to sex education, for example, maybe abortion, um, issues that relate to identity, orthodoxy, religious matters, you see some marginal groups which you wouldn't dream of having the capacity to articulate the arguments that they are articulating or having the spread on social media in terms of effect, having the capacity to do it. That's, you can trace that back to uh, Russian money. There is a small party now in Cyprus which is the Hunters Party, uh, which is a very large group because hunting is very popular in Cyprus. And there, there are rumors, I cannot confirm it, that they, they are receiving money from Russian sources and they are stoking, stoking this kind of polarization when it comes to crucial arguments, either with the purpose of diverting public opinion from issues or actually uh, dividing them on key issues. Maybe just to add, um, it's also clearly a problem here in Brussels and in Belgium as well. We've had Prime Minister de Croo the last two weeks uh, speak to the Belgian parliament about how the police are investigating MEPs that are being funded by Russia. So. Uh, Politico broke the story in the Brussels bubble about this. Uh, we're all trying to find out who, we want names, um, and we're being shut out by some of the parties that are finding out. This morning uh, in our newsroom we were talking about trying to get access to some of the far right because we suspect they're part of this. <laughs> um, and we were told, uh, no, you're too woke. Uh, so we'll have to try another way to find out, but we're not there <coughs> yet. Uh, what I would say is just coming back on your, your last comments, Christopher, um, about uh, legislation that could help. Um, the EU passed this uh, Media Freedom Act and it's mostly about protecting journalists. It's quite good. One of the few restrictions it places on media outlets themselves is they have to disclose their ownership. And what is true for politicians is also true for media. They should be required to say where their money is coming from and then you can close off with legal tools the financial mechanisms that make this possible. We found out last week that Euronews is funded by Hungarian oligarchs. You know, uh, it's not just Russia that's a problem here. And uh, what time is it now? So less than an hour ago, the editorial team of Euronews tried to put out a message saying they're not influenced by this Hungarian money. So they're having to defend themselves now. This is true everywhere. It's not just uh, outside on the periphery like Cyprus. It's also true here in the capital of the European Union. From top to bottom. All right, we have we have one more question here in the front. Thank you. Yes, is it open or not? We can do it. Right. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks to all of you. They were very interesting presentations. But I would like to stay a little bit in Cyprus for 
for um, different reasons. Uh, among, I'm Clementine, but I'm Clementine, yeah, I'm only one of the commission and the STATCOM team. So dealing with strategic communication. So Nicholas, you mentioned that um, the instinct of the Greek, of the Cypriot society is still pro-Russian. Um, <coughs> can you give some reasons for that? Well, I can understand, but um, I would expect this to change progressively after 20 years of membership in the EU, probably it has not. So that's my first question. And the second one is about fact-checking and about um, possible involvement of the civil society in Cyprus in the fight against this information. Is there a state concern, a state interest about what is going on with this possible or hidden Russian influence? which I understand we cannot identify 100%, and um, are there any actions like media literacy, enhancing independent journalism? I don't know, uh, you said that investigative journalism is not a popular, so, so what is going on there in this front? Do we have actions? Mm. Maybe that, thank you. Right, um, on the first part of your question, um, it's, it's difficult to identify the very specific reason why the secret society is so rustified. I, I mean, I, I showed in, in the presentation, it's a combination of various things. It, it is um, orthodoxy, the, the, the religion, the, the affiliation. There's a lot of money coming from the Russia going to the church, various orthodox church, also the Church of Cyprus. Uh, there is money that comes from Russian businessmen who actually build churches in Cyprus because there is a growing Russian community. There's about 60 to 80,000 Russian citizens in, in Cyprus. Um, there's a huge dependence on Russian money by the Cypriot infrastructure, the services, the accountants, the lawyers, the tourism, uh, everything. Um, there is this misguided idea from 1974 when Turkey invaded Cyprus and NATO's complicity because Turkey was an ally a NATO ally and all that, that has remained in the in the DNA of the Cypriot. So, you know, they're very suspicious of anything that is, you know, NATO or American. And the Communist Party always consistently gets up to 25-30%, which is a very strong percentage, which has a big say. Um, what else? The EU? What about the EU? Okay, well, look, um, we joined the EU in 2004. Uh, there, there was a, a, a phase of what I call a, a political maturity, which kind of led us to 2010. Then the economic collapse came. That took us back. There was a lot of desperation. People's values changed. Their principles changed. Their, their focus changed. So they were susceptible to all those things that matter to those who want to exploit a certain situation. Um, to the second part of your question, um, <coughs> we are lacking on media literacy for sure. The state is not investing at all in this. Uh, there are some isolated actions, usually by people who are interested, some civil society organizations. We as an institute are now beginning a pilot scheme on media literacy. We are also beginning a scheme on promoting investigative journalism. Um, the problem with the transparency that Chris mentioned before is, is fundamental to Cyprus. There is no online legislation regulating the media. So now we know, for example, that most Cypriots get their news from online. We have no idea who owns the online environment. Uh, there have been rumors, and there are only rumors, so I, I can't say there was a big legal firm which had le uh, Russian clients who owned various media outlets. Now, they did that not because they had an agenda which was Putin-related, but they did that because they wanted to serve the agenda of their clients. That's true. That, that is what we know, but we can't prove it for sure. We don't have the investigative journalism to expose that. So that's why the European Media Freedom Act is so crucial, because it has that element in it which will force the media to expose these things. I'll leave it there. Uh, do we have other questions from the audience? Yes, please. All right. Um, maybe expose some of mine. Uh, I was wondering, um, so you, you are the audience manager of Euractive. No, my question is, what is the perception of the audience when they read sometimes crazy things which come as a message from the disinformation centers? Because I would say that my feeling is that 
people tend to to read anything and also maybe do you know like how how easy is it also to, to believe it <coughs> and then take a political stance on it? What is your perception of that from directive or <coughs> any other media? I think um, what's what's important is the targeting of your message. So your active audience is not the same as the audience of a top work newspaper, let's say. Like our primary audience is actually Brussels, it's the it's the bubble, you can expect that there's a level of education, that they are reading other newspapers, that they are informed. Um, now this does not mean that they are better or more discerning at uh, fake information. It just means that the targeting, of, you have to try different messages to get them. So um, I, I gave actually a good example with the New York Times piece. Uh, there are certain issues, certain leanings where your audience will be better. If you want to get a well-meaning cosmopolitan audience on board, bring in the racial aspect. Bring in the fact that Ukrainians are racist and they're attacking black people. Or bring in the fact that it's the West and it's them being colonial again and telling us all how to behave or saying, what about Iraq? It's the same as what the US did in Iraq. And these are the things that help with the audience of your actor. Uh, <laughs> but they, not every argument would. So then, you know, some of the arguments that you would hear about in the Cypriot press, they wouldn't translate over here because, like, we're broadly okay with NATO in the Brussels bubble, for example. So those kind of questions wouldn't work. Um, huge skepticism about America. I think there's a low level of it here, but it's still there, but not in the same way. Um, so what is clever about Russian disinformation is they take a targeted approach. They, they're not just spraying every message wherever and hoping it lands. They know exactly who their audiences are um, and what they are more amenable to listening to. So yeah, the directive, our challenge always comes from those type of arguments I mentioned at the beginning, but uh, very rarely would it come from something that a tabloid newspaper would have to do. Um, also, a very direct question. Um, so, on a legal from a legal perspective, many things are being worked on. Uh, what are we doing though to prepare ourselves prior to the European elections? Because we have seen, as Jules also mentioned, uh, with the elections in the U.S. and also the referendum uh, with Britain. So, in a couple of months, we will have the elections. We definitely know that the Russian machine is working towards uh, spreading the messages. So how can we protect ourselves? I'll try not to give you a classic AVP answer. Uh, no, I, I think, yeah. <laughs> I'll try as I said. Uh, no, but um, I don't think, to, to be honest, I don't think many EU states uh, or the EU is ready to counter the, 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 the Russian disinformation machine, war machine, you could say even. Uh, it is so, as, as uh, has uh, been highlighted both here and there, uh, and in many stories throughout the last couple of years, the Russian uh, disinformation machine is very efficient. And when they can target uh, down to tabloid media, tabloid media on Cyprus or any other member state, it speaks uh, levels, it speaks volumes about how good they are at it. And the EU is not there yet. As I said, we don't even have the, the proper funding for our fact-checking community. And if you want to, if we really wanted to counter this disinformation war we are in with with Russia now, especially ahead of the election, we should have given much more money to the fact-checking community because uh, now we have the issue, of course, as you, as you highlighted before, Chris. Um, it's very important to, to immediately put the right information out there. You can't just let people read the, 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 uh, the titles uh, of, uh, of or the headlines of uh, news stories and then, or possibly fake news stories, and then just not do anything about it. There we need the fact-checking community to say, okay, this, we'll just flag this and we'll link to some proper information down below. Um, so no, I don't think the EU is ready, and I don't, I don't know how much effect it will actually have on the election. That is hard to say, but I, it's clear that it will have some kind of effect, and we will only know afterwards, uh, after the ninth of year, what the uh, what the effect have been. But it's gonna create conflict, fragmentation, 
and we are not ready to count at that at this point. Can I yes, one thing? Of um, first of all, um, I liked what Chris said before about uh, being biased towards truth. Um, this idea of truth not being neutral, and we should accept the fact that truth is truth. And this is more for journalists and, and the journalistic world. Um, but it also, beyond media literacy and, and everything else that we can do beyond legislation, it's something that we all can do as individuals. And I think our, our digital lifestyle has forced us to become victims of these things, even if we don't want to, even if we are discerning. Sometimes you mentioned it about the headline capturing us before we are able to go and see the other side. So we have a responsibility as individuals to slow down. You know, um, we don't have the time, obviously, but let's make better use of that time. Let's just not continuously scroll and let's stop ourselves. It, it matters for us to go for what is a slow journalism, but we should also be slow readers and discerning uh, uh, readers as well. If we make that difference, if we make that leap, we will force the market to, to adhere to what we want rather than become victims of it. Um, I think that's a very good point. Um, that is also something that the parliament uh, suggested. But um, but the the issue with it is also that maybe uh, maybe I'm all, I'm, I'm not uh, criticizing your point. I'm just uh, asking a question rather. That what do we do with the people who don't want a lot of information? They want it sensational. They want it short. They only want to read the headline. And if you give them, I, I just said the opposite. I am fully aware of that. That also suggested giving them the right information. But what do we do? Is there any examples from the from Cyprus that would be worth highlighting this? Okay. <laughs> Exactly. And TikTok, is it being uh, used as a, is, is it being weaponized? Uh, there's, yeah. I, it, it's, there's one, one thing is legislation, another thing is the, the responsibility for the individual, but it's hard at this point to leave it up to the, to the individual because uh, even those of us who've been working with this information for a while now, we don't know exactly what to do on a private level to be. I, I don't. Uh, hopefully other people do, but I don't as far as it. Okay, of course. Uh, hi there, Gordon Walsh, and in this case from Unhack Democracy, we, we, we're trying out a new um, thing in, in Central Europe, particularly which we call hope-based communication, but it's really agency-based communication. And it's trying to come up with, you know, our own narratives and our own um, arguments for what it is um, that we happen to believe in, in, in democratic society. Um, it's one thing to fact check, it's one thing to um, criticize their headlines for being wrong. I just want to ask, what do you think we should do to promote our own kind of, you know, headlines, our own narratives, our own defense of the free society? I can go first because it kind of follows uh, your, your last comments and then these things I wanted to say. Um, so I think um, at the you've got to you've got to reward the people who are doing it the right way more. Um, so um, like we, we were just getting onto a thing about um, young people and they scroll and you know how do you get your short message across? Like this is something that media is obsessed with every day. How do we do this? Um, but it's also an absolute bugger to monetize it. Um, like, your, like TikTok, for example, I don't know who has TikTok here. We had it interactive, we stopped doing it altogether. Um, there is no referral traffic across from TikTok. So if you're an online media, you need people to come to your website, whether it's through a subscription to pay or to see your advertisements. TikTok doesn't help you with either of those things. So there's literally no money in it. If you want to put good things into this space, we have to find a business model that's going to make it work. Um, Instagram, a bit easier. It's also much bigger still. So we can show some more hopeful signs there. Um, in Belgium, in Flanders, the public broadcaster VRT. So this is important. Public broadcaster means they don't have to worry about their business model like, <laughs> like a private one does. So they can experiment more. What they've done, they've created um, a media called News 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 which is for Generation Alpha, which I've discovered uh, only in the last month or so, is the people after Gen Z, so children. Um, 
and they they were like, okay, what do children like? They like bright colours, they like bold text, really short, really comprehensible language to the point. Great, so they've done that, public funded, so you know, easy, communicates the news in the headline already, you don't have to drive the traffic, it's you know very child friendly. What did they find? Biggest demographic using it, people in their thirties and forties. <laughs> Children are using it as well, like more than they use uh, VRT's normal channels. But uh, the message isn't that they. The message is this: the message is that if you make something good, it will be good for everyone. And people want short information. It's not just kids who care about it. Old people like that too. Uh, get to the point. So, but we need to find a way to monetize it. So that's one side: incentivize this behaviour. This is something where the EU and national governments can come in big time. But then again, also going back to the point of penalizing those who don't do the right thing. Like, make it hard for these irresponsible media to put out irresponsible headlines by flushing out who owned them and where that money comes from that allows them to do this in the first place. And then there might be a bit of a reality check. Uh, but every media should be held to account for its decisions, for its practices. It should be all available on the website. And yet every reader isn't going to read through the terms and conditions, but governments should. Uh, and governments should be looking at this to see where they can intervene to slap down the bad behavior and help the good behavior. Well, I was going to actually, that's a very interesting point. I was going to uh, ask Christopher with regard to the legislation, um, whether there is way of, a way of pressure, uh, pressuring the platforms to actually tweak their algorithms in a way that will allow for fact-checking stuff to come up in, in, in new threads rather than the fact-checking coming only when it comes to the specific article that is being fact-checked. So if the, if the platforms were able to uh, allow for fact-checking to appear even among audiences which are not seeking the fact-checking, especially among those who don't seek it, then it might be more helpful to you know, at least alleviate the, the problems that arise from, from this uh, information. I think that's a, a very good, uh, a good idea, and it, it, it could be a possibility, I'm sure. I think it all depends also on the on the next commission and what their priorities will be. Of course, uh, the head of the commission will have a big role to play there, of course. But uh, yeah, uh, I think it's a, it's important to look into this as well. I I forget the initial question to be honest. Uh, what about promoting our own narratives? I mean, you're a politician. How do you get that much people? Uh, the right business model is, of course, uh, a necessary thing for media and so on, but how do politicians do it? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, we've just uh, been reading through a, a survey that was uh, done recently where it was pretty clear that those parties were performing well were far-right far parties. I think most of it may be also far-left parties, but at least far-out parties uh, who who are very uh, conscious about using the, the way that algorithms work. They, um, what, whatever, whatever creates anger is very useful, and the far right and the far left is very good at doing that. that was, they, they had one positive thing in this, in this survey, and that was a Polish, Polish politician, liberal maybe, uh, who managed to also perform well on social media. But, to me, this was a special case because he was uh, he was gay, and being that in Poland, especially during the, the former uh, government, of course, a huge challenge. So he was uh, very um, based on like his his uh, content was very much based on his values and his fight with the more conservative values of the then Polish government, and he was performing well. But that's a unique scenario because you have something you have a common enemy. So you have a you have a character. You could almost say you have a you have a um, a natural role to play in a in a story where there's good guys and bad guys. So that makes it easier. And for 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 my boss, for instance, that would be hard because he's he's not a member of a of a particular minority. He's a white male. Uh, that that doesn't give you much these days. Um, um, well, of course it does. But yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, sorry for those who. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, he, he doesn't have any group that he belongs to. So who do we speak to? He's performing uh, very bad on social media, 
and it's uh, we're still trying to figure out how to be as promoted as others with more sharp opinions, but we haven't figured it out yet. I was going to come in with a comment that I think it lands well, I won't dominate all the time, but um, every year there's a, a report that comes out uh, called the Edelman Trust Barometer, how much um, is, tr is there trust in business, media, politics, uh, and civil society organizations? The, the, the short story is it's falling. Um, the, the question is, who are people trusting and why? And this changes over time a bit. It's quite exciting. So um, the meta-narrative is authority figures are on the decline. This maybe isn't shocking uh, for people. Scientists still do OK. Uh, CEOs had a good time in the early 2000s. They, they haven't had one since. Uh, politicians uh, for sure don't, uh, but sadly media don't either, uh, more and more. Uh, the rising category for trust is someone like me. Not me, but the quote, someone like me. Um, and this, this is where you do see um, the extremes on the political spectrum doing a good job. You also see some media trying to do it when they appeal to young audiences. Changing the face of the message and the message itself to adapt it to that audience so it's someone like them. This goes in two directions. It's not just about being woke or something. Um, like if, you're, if you're the Ukrainian military right now, you are wrapping your messages to cast doubt on in, in Putin in narratives that are otherwise like very Russian and maybe even critical of Ukraine. You, you choose one narrative to help you get another one in there that might not have otherwise. And what we need to see on the in the center of politics is using other voices. So if you're an MEP in his 60s, the answer is not that you get yourself on TikTok, it's that you get other people who believe in your ideas who maybe are more like that audience to help in sharing that message. Um, people like them will communicate better. They'll, be, they'll get through this uh, threshold of being believed uh, way easier than someone who's further away. It's terrible, you should listen to the message, but people are people, and people are tribal still, and believe people who are, yes, more like them. Very interesting point. I'll just, I'll yeah. just mention something with regard to um, the elections, uh, the upcoming elections. I don't think it will happen here, and this happened a long time ago, but last year, a New York court convicted a guy called Ricky Vaughan, who had a Twitter account in 2016 with 58,000 followers, which was a big number for them, for Twitter, not anymore. But he used that account to um, approach Hillary Clinton voters, and he tweeted a telephone number, a toll-free tele telephone number, for them to call if they wanted to vote for Hillary Clinton. And four and, four and a half thousand people actually called that number thinking they were voting for Hillary Clinton and did not go on polling day to vote for Hillary Clinton. So there are, there are various things beyond fake news which all these trolls can do, especially with an ignorant society, uh, to, to actually tweak, um, uh, throw an election either way. Yeah. <clears throat> Do we have any other questions from the audience? This is literally the last chance. Mm -hmm. If we don't, um, I would suggest no, in, in, no, 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 oh, no, no, no. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> <Do> we have <laughs> Cyprus, and I asked myself, it's maybe for the whole round here, if you can think of a, a country which had a, or whose media landscape was in a, a situation comparable to the Cyprian situation right now, um, but that worked its way back to a more favorable situation, and if so, what do you think were factors that benefited this positive development? struggling with that because, um, well, in, in our annual surveys of at least Cyprus, the, the one that's going to come out this year, things haven't changed much in terms of the risk factors, transparency, plurality, territorial independence, political independence, all these things haven't changed much. So I, I can't really compare whether we improved or not. And what I said about things changing are based more on a hunch rather than actual hard facts. 
uh, in terms of other countries having done it, who I don't know. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll, I'll divert to Clementine, who has better sense of the um, European. Yeah, I'm reflecting. I would probably think of um, Baltic countries, but I'm not sure how how the media landscape was before. But what I know is Poland, maybe. It's it's a very specific case. If you ask Dutch people, they will say they will have no disinformation <laughs> for for a number of reasons. But but. The Baltic countries have been very proactive now and very dynamic against this information. Of course, they are a big target, that's why. But I'm not sure what was the media landscape before so as to be able to, to say what the evolution is. But they are a good, a good example now. And of course, this question might also be hard to, uh, to answer because it's hard to measure the situation getting better. It's, it's maybe also very... Um, <coughs> Mm, undefined question from my from my side, so it's, it's hard to measure this development. I would say, to measure when when a media landscape is in a bad situation and to then say that it's in a good situation again, it's very difficult to tell. Maybe. Well, we'll see what the European Media Freedom Act does in five years' time. Whether that might have an effect generally across Europe. I know for sure that it will it will force things to happen in Cyprus, which otherwise would not have happened. That's true. And in many other countries. No? Um, I don't think on a recent time scale that there is a country that has rebounded from it like Cyprus has. I think have, it's not that it's hard to measure, it's that I don't think it's happening. The, the trend of these reports is that things go downwards. You saw Belgium colored in red on one slide. That actually surprised me. I didn't think Belgium was that bad, but uh, it's a uh, cause for concern. Um, it's important to think about, in, maybe you can cast your net further back, what has helped media rebound. Uh, the problem is the examples I can think of are quite extreme. It's like uh, after World War II, or it's after the Cold War. Uh, but maybe there is still something to learn from those experiences even so, even though they're more dramatic than if Cyprus was to turn around right now. Um, it's the economics environment in which your media is, is operating, and it's the political slash cultural one. Um, in the cases of the post-Cold War countries, but I think the Baltics have got quite a good media landscape. Uh, Poland is deteriorating, but um, the three Baltics are still good. Um, and Germany after the war, um, huge taboos, one enforced by military, one enforced by fear of the still existing neighbor, of adopting a view of someone bad, uh, like that we deem as Europe bad. Um, so that's important. How do you create that? Uh, Right now, I don't think we have the existential threat, so it's going to be way harder to do. But maybe the other side, the economic one, is where we can pay more attention. So in both cases, there were, part, there were parties, political parties, but also other parties, interested in funding the new media landscape. So um, in Germany, it's like villages and towns after the Second World War wanting to communicate. The US funded a lot of it to try and build a liberal democratic landscape. In the post-Cold War countries, political parties funded newspapers quickly so they could get their messages out in a newly competitive landscape. So there were people behind it who wanted to increase uh, messages where there were not. We have the problem now that the landscape is, is closing in on fewer and fewer big voices. So what that says to me is some of the points I said earlier uh, about um, supporting the good guys and, and following the money for the bad guys. Um, but it's also about competition legislation. We have a really robust competition commission here in Europe. I remember in 2013, living in the UK, complaining to Commissioner Bestea, saying, who was the competition commissioner even then, um, saying, why can't you do something about the UK landscape, which is dominated by like, five old, really right-wing white dudes? And she's like, it's not in Irene then. So add it, add the media landscape to the European Competition Commission's remit. Uh, in every country, competition is a huge issue. Um, increase the number of voices, you'll already increase the access that citizens have to information. But that's, that's what the European Media Freedom Act does. I mean, that's the legal basis, essentially, for the act. Competition and a healthy business environment. But there's no requirements, like, um, when you, um, you know, like in, in the UK Competition Commission, for example, when you merge two supermarkets and they exceed 50%, boom, done. Like you can't do that. They're going to block it. With this, it's still too soft. Like, yeah. Be clear on what the thresholds are when this is too, too bad and then stop it. I think from, from the process of agreeing on the Media Freedom Act, it was, it was a huge issue. From the beginning, the, the French and the, and the Germans, uh, not all of them, but some of them, 
wanted to just uh, completely make sure that the Commission could not interfere in any member state uh, if there were, if it was only national uh, legislation or national uh, media initiatives, which is of course that was not the not not the intention behind the legislation. So we fought it, even though Danish stakeholders were all, all also very much afraid, because especially regional markets are dominated by a few players. But it's it's. I think the the it will be interesting to see if the if the compromise reached will be uh, will be something that's for the commission that's able to use it if if some member states uh, start uh, legislating against certain media uh, that will be interesting. One thing that's also worth highlighting uh, with the Media Freedom Act it also gives uh, special status to media content online. This is also tricky. It could also be misused for sure uh, in some member states, but it gives media who are uh, recognized nationally uh, special status for their content. Their content can't just be removed except through a special process, uh, but the platform has to talk, uh, be in close dialogue with the, with the media. This is also interesting, and this is also an initiative to make it easier for media to combat disinformation if it's going to be misused by, in some member states by media who will be approved by national authorities who are maybe very close friends to a guy called Orban or something. Uh, that, that could very much be the case, but we will have to see. But uh, it's hopefully the Media Freedom Act is uh, the latest uh, addition to the to the to combat and counter different disinformation. Also, the AI Act in terms of. Um, it has to be uh, emphasized if, if a video or image is uh, AI generated. Yes. So this is a time to wrap up uh, our conversation. Um, since uh, we in the liberal community are very much uh, influenced by the home-based uh, communication, uh, I will give just half a minute to each and every one of our uh, panelists um, to give us a message of hope, because I've heard many things that we should be worried about. Um, so maybe, yeah, you wrap up on how we solve the challenges. Um, not, not on how we solve the challenges, but uh, hope, nonetheless. Okay. <laughs> I think one thing that is hopeful, um, and it's happening strangely also in the United States, but it's happening, I think, in Europe, is that we're having more non-profit public interest investigative journalism taking place. I notice that a lot. There's more attention paid to investigative journalism, there's more of it, and there's more clean money going towards it. And I think that's quite hopeful. Yes, for me it's always hard to be optimistic on a Monday, but I'll try. <laughs> um, I think one of the positive things uh, is, is, is also that I've seen something I've seen in Denmark. Uh, as long as we've been working on this information in the parliament, there has been no interest from, from Danish media or Danish citizens. It's like, what is this issue? Disinformation? Is it, is it illegal to have a wrong opinion? It's like, no, that's not what we're talking about. But now, uh, after the Russian invasion and after solid reporting by media, we've seen stories of Russian agents sitting in Moscow, uh, um, posting Danish articles, posting Danish comments on social media. So there is an awareness now that we're, that, that we're, not, that we're not there before. So that's very positive, uh, and I hope that will also ensure that it will be an even greater focus for, for politicians in the next mandate. Uh, despite everything, everything we're worrying about, which is all valid, and all the questions we have, all the doubts we have, all of the fears for Europe, we have never been this united on a position when it comes to Russia, and we've stayed at it. And we look better than the US at the moment in our position on Russia. <laughs> um, our eyes are open, but we are also doing stuff about it. The Czech Republic has identified media being funded by Russia. The Belgian government has identified MEPs being funded by Russia. We are, do we are seeing the problems and we are taking action across Europe with this opponent in mind. Amazing. So, uh, Jules Matan, thank you very much for hosting this event and uh, having us over. Uh, Mr. Peribis, thank you very much. Mr. Frenzer, thank you. And Chris Paulus, thank you very much. And thanks to the audience for being with us today.